Hello. Bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. Just waiting for a few people to tune in and we'll get started. We are so excited today to have Duke Redbird with us. I'm just waiting to make sure that we've gone live on all platforms. We are here on Periscope, which is on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. And uh, here for a very special edition of DWF Live with Dr. Duke Redbird. So just waiting. If you are tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I can see which platform you're on as well. And I'd love to have you as part of the conversation today because the best part about these DWF Live sessions is that they are interactive. So you'll have the opportunity to ask Duke any questions you may have and to learn some amazing wisdom that he has for us during this time. So yes, say hello. Let's just make sure we're good to go here. In the meantime, so Duke is just waiting in our proverbial backstage, but I'd love to tell you a little bit about him first. Dr. Duke Redbird is an established Indigenous intellectual, poet, painter, broadcaster, filmmaker, and orator. He brings his breadth of cultural knowledge and artistic practice to the benefit of a global audience. Dr. Redbird was an instrumental in the implementation of innovative multimedia technologies and beyond, bringing an Indigenous approach to art education that was rooted in his pioneering work at OCAD University. Dr. Redbird's legacy stretches far beyond his work in Canada. His art's been exhibited and his poetry has been published and translated in anthologies around the world. Dr. Duke Redbird is a multifaceted artist practicing across a number of disciplines, including literature, painting, theater, cinema, and most recently spoken word poetry. Um, I'm hoping that he will read some poems for us today as well. He's a well-known broadcaster and television personality and is in demand as a public speaker in university, community college, and elementary school settings. Dr. Redbird received his Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies from York University in 1978, his doctorate from OCAD in 2013. As a poet, essayist, and screenwriter, he has published and performed poetry readings, theater productions, video and film, locally and internationally. He has a published book of poetry, Love, Shine, and Red Wine, and this was his inspiration for a multimedia musical production um, at a performance before Queen Elizabeth II. In 1985, Dr. Redbird represented Canada at the Valmiki World Poetry Festival in India, representing the opening address. He has a Silver Hugo Award at the Chicago Film Festival for a drama he produced. He was a familiar face on TV and arts and entertainment as a reporter for City TV. And he also has his property in Bark Lake near Algonquin Park. And I'm sure he will be telling us as well about a very special learning place that he has here in Toronto down by the water. He divides his time between his project in the north, his work also with the Toronto District School Board and other educational institutions, delivers a unique perspective from his heritage that is both a positive and optimistic alternative to how we view our universe in the 21st century. He has some particular wisdom around the pandemic as well that he will share with us at this time. He's been honored by the Native community and recognized as an elder and wisdom keeper. He's also the curator, advisor of Indigenous Art and Culture for the Toronto District School Board Museum, Fine Arts Collection and Archives. Um, you know, often when we have guests, I will read up about them and scan over who they are and try to give you a really short and concise bio. But I felt it was important to honor Dr. Duke Redford with all of his accomplishments. At 81 years old, there is still so much wisdom in life that he's sharing with us. But I think just honoring that whole journey is uh, really important for us to do today. So be part of the conversation. I'm going to bring in Duke Redford. Well, Hello. thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, gosh, I, when I when I uh, when I hear an introduction like that, uh, it uh, yeah, I realize I am 81 years old. I was actually <laughs> uh, born in 1939, just before the uh, Second World War started. In fact, uh, I was born in March 1939, and uh, in uh, in uh, September of that year, the Second World War started. So uh, my life started uh, in a in a pandemic of of, of sorts, a world uh, a world war, a Second World War, and uh, here we are, eighty one years later. So the uh, it's it certainly uh, brings to mind that 
no matter what happens, uh, this too shall pass. So uh, I know that I want to say Ani and Bojo and Sego and good afternoon to everybody out there uh, that's watching this broadcast. And uh, we're uh, in very difficult times now. There's no doubt about it. We're uh, in uh, sheltered in place, as it uh, as they say. Uh, but um, there is always light at the end of the tunnel, and I know that um, uh, after uh, all all these years, I can uh, I can assure everyone that uh, as bad as it can be, it uh, it will all, always pass, and hopefully, it passes for the better. So, uh, thank you for joining uh, this afternoon, and uh, I'm happy to uh, engage in any way that you would like, Audrey. Oh, well, I think with you, I, I always feel like whenever we've spoken, um, I always just want to kind of sit with you and learn whatever it is that you feel to share. So we're very open today. Remember, the first time I met you was actually on my birthday last year. Oh, yeah, we came uh, a few of the members of the Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund. We came and joined you. Um, and Nancy on the water and you shared with us that day. Can you tell us about um, that learning opportunity that was there and what you've created in that beautiful boat? Well, yes, it was, uh, 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 last summer, um, I, I had uh, uh, thought about this project for a long, long time. Uh, I, I saw that uh, over the years, uh, there, there was no evidence of indigenous uh, presence or culture along the waterfront um, for as long as I can remember. From the Don River to the Humber River, there, there just wasn't anything that said indigenous people once lived here. And uh, uh, often when I talk to people uh, about the uh, history of Toronto and the waterfront, uh, they're really uh, uh, amazed at uh, how much history the waterfront actually has. And um, I decided that uh, maybe an art installation on the waterfront would uh, would attract people. And um, I, I, I guess you all remember a couple of years ago, there was a big yellow duck sitting out on the waterfront. And <laughs> yes. that was fun. And people came down and had took selfies and everything. And so it, in, it inspired me to say, well, uh, if there was an indigenous inst art installation on the waterfront, uh, maybe uh, I could uh, get the word out that there was uh, a long history of indigenous presence on the waterfront. And that uh, was uh, something that the indigenous people chose to share with the citizens of Toronto uh, through treaty. Uh, back in 1908 and, and onwards. And so it was an opportunity to have a, a discussion and, uh, and a dialogue and a, and, and a narrative with the citizens of Toronto and people came down. And I had um, uh, my good uh, a friend and colleague, a fellow artist, uh, Philip Cody, uh, who uh, uh, teamed up with me and I painted a mural on one side of the boat and um, uh, I and uh, and I uh, painted uh, 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 Philip uh, painted the other other side. I, I might even have a picture of it right here on my desk. Uh, if you just excuse me for a second, I I think so. Uh, everybody gets an idea of what it what it uh, what it looked like oh, yeah. down down at the. Her front is that Here, hold it nice and close. I'll take myself out of the stream for a sec. Uh, there it is. Uh, and I told you, and uh, down at Harbor Front. I, I not at Harbor Front at the um, at at the uh, uh, um, oh gosh, where's my brain going? I over over on, on the other side. Uh, the the marina at Ontario Place, yeah. So that's where it was, and it was uh, uh, a wonderful summer, and uh, we wanted to repeat it this year, but unfortunately, um, it, that's not possible. We can't uh, have it in the water this year. But I'm still going to have the boat uh, 
I, I may do some podcasts uh, or, you know, from the boat, just, uh, uh, but there won't be any uh, opportunity to have people around, uh, of course. Right. And what's the name of it again? Can you tell us about the name and significance? Wigwam Chichimam. Uh, wigwam Chichimam. Yeah, a wigwam is uh, means means habitat or house or lodge, and uh, chi means big, and chimang is a canoe. So it's a, <laughs> a big canoe house or a house houseboat. And it does, yeah. It is a it, yeah. It's a it is a houseboat and. It's the day we came to visit, it was pouring rain, I remember, and we sat, we got to sit inside for the most part and learn about some of the work. And, uh, and you, yeah, you really shared with us a lot of the history and understanding, because I think part of us learning the residential school story is also understanding that there's this rich history pre-contact. There's, there's so much that we need to understand about the place we are. There is, uh, if we go back uh, uh, to uh, 1908, for instance, yeah. there was a dredging crew uh, hired by the uh, uh, city of Toronto, or that at least it was uh, it, it was a village, uh, and they were dredging out in 1908. Yeah, in the city of Toronto, and they discovered under the uh, water the uh, footprints that had been embedded in the blue clay underneath the water of Lake Ontario. And it was about 300 uh, moccasin footprints of, of large ones, children, uh, uh, large, small. Uh, there was a whole trek that had taken place right along the, the uh, waterfront of Toronto and they had left their moccasin clad footprints in the blue clay right beneath the uh, at bay and and uh, and and front street down at the waterfront and that was the first Torontonians that we uh, have any record of uh, that uh, passed through this area 12,000 years ago and at the time the uh, the paper was called the the globe it was in the globe mail at the time it was called the globe and a reporter came down and did a uh, a story on uh, on these uh, this event, and uh, of course, in those days, the uh, workmen uh, they got their picture taken and a story told and everything, and then they they covered up the footprints. So they're still under there somewhere, uh, but they uh, remind us that uh, Toronto has been a meeting place for thousands of years, and uh, it still is, and it's a place where. Uh, we call it uh, Toronto. It's a um, it's a Haudenosaunee word uh, that means meeting place, and it uh, really what it represents is that there were trees out in the uh, uh, kind of forming a weir out in the uh, in in the Toronto the waterfront, and the uh, fish would come and meet there around those trees. So it was not only a meeting place for for nature and the fish meeting there and the trees standing in the water that attracted them, but also became a meeting place for the whole world as it is today uh, in uh, and Toronto is uh, is the meeting place and it shared with every, every there's I think the, the most ethnically diverse Community in North America is right here in our 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 beautiful city. That's wonderful. I know that's one thing I'm really grateful about living here is the diversity and being able to learn from so many different people, enjoy so much different types of food and culture. Yeah, there's a lot there, and I'm really grateful that there's a kind of an establishment or um, Re-establishment or that indigenous placemaking piece that's so important, and I know that's been a passion of yours as well. So, yeah, excited to see this start. This start to come to the forefront, so we can remember. Well, now uh, uh, anyone uh, going around the, around the city, there's marvelous indigenous artist Philip Cody among them, uh, who's doing in incredible uh, murals and uh, and 
there's uh, so much art and history being developed and, and talked about. And, and uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Bonnie Devine, who's a, a, a world-renowned uh, artist, uh, who's working in, in the city of Toronto as well, doing doing her work. And, uh, and there's, uh, if uh, uh, you go in, in um, various parts of the city, you, you see uh, uh, evidence of Indigenous art uh, being developed by young people and by uh, established artists. So it's, it's uh, really, really something to uh, uh, see this uh, blossoming of an Indigenous presence in Toronto, that's for sure. Philip Cote actually has been involved with our organization that we have legacy spaces in Toronto that have commissioned him. The most notable one is probably Rogers Communications on the 17th floor. He did this beautiful boardroom table um, that really represents Turtle Island, but he has many different clans represented there. And there's a lot of meaning and depth. And I know that uh, his art's gratefully appreciated both there and he has another piece at Scotiabank on Bay and Queen and then also many others so that's, that's, that's part of the, uh, the work that's, that's, uh, that's going on and um, uh, when we look at the history of uh, of Toronto and we we go back uh, uh, the earliest uh, evidence of human beings living in in North America which we call uh, Turtle Island actually goes about back about a hundred thousand years it's amazing there were uh, in California for instance they found evidence of, of uh, human activity uh, actually uh, uh, slaughtering uh, uh, and, and cutting up uh, mammoths so uh, oh, wow. Uh, now they they uh, say well uh, there's there's a lot of talk that by by uh, credible scholars who say that North America uh, may have been hit a couple of times by big meteors and that's why uh, some of the, uh, the the big animals uh, were wiped out in the Americas that and didn't happen in Africa and that's why there's no no lions or tigers or giraffes or, or horses and, and 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 yet they find plenty of uh, skeletons of these animals that once lived in North America so there's uh, uh, humans have been here for uh, as long as uh, time immemorial as long as uh, as as we have history for and uh, and that's uh, important to know because um, uh, for a long time, it, the the story was that there was an ice age, and 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 after the ice age, about twelve thousand years ago, uh, people moved from the uh, across from the uh, across the Bering Strait. But now we find out that no, that's not true at all. There's there's been uh, human beings uh, here uh, right back as far as uh, archaeology can take us, and this is uh, very exciting for. Um, uh, how we view Canada, because Canada is only 150 years uh, since Confederation, but boy, do we have a long history that goes back so much further, and uh, it's uh, it's it's something that um, now that we're we're at home and we can be on Wikipedia and the internet and so on. There's there's uh, lots out there now talking about the uh, history of, of the indigenous people in the Americas. And, and I encourage anybody who wants to know more about that to just get on your uh, devices or whatever they are and, and hit uh, Wikipedia and, uh, and the internet. You'll find so much interesting um, information. And we also encourage people, if you're listening right now live, you can ask a question for Duke Redbird as well. We do have a comment here from Elizabeth. Hello, and thanks, Duke Redbird, she says. So oh. hello, Elizabeth. Thank you for tuning in. And yeah. for anybody else, come say hi. I mean, the uh, as I said, when I, I, I'm here with my cup of tea. I'm just so happy being able to sit and listen. Um, well, good. 
here's here's uh, my cup of coffee, and if you could see, it's a it's as a painting of of one of Norval Morso's uh, reproduction of one of his wonderful paintings of of the uh, of the Thunderbird. And I actually wrote a poem uh, about uh, Norval Morso. He he's he's been called the the grandfather of indigenous art. And we also have, I have a book here by Daphne Ojig, who is considered to be the uh, grandmother of indigenous art. Uh, wow. And the, these two, uh, both Norvell and, uh, and, and Daphne Ojig, uh, they, they, uh, they passed, uh, they're incredible artists. And behind me, you can probably see that beautiful painting. Yeah, do you want to tell us about that? I'll make you full screen. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a painting that uh, my my son, J. Bell Redbird, uh, painted. And it's the, uh, the Redbird flying and, uh, and the two figures uh, uh, that uh, the Redbird is, is uh, hold, holding up uh, above. And it was uh, flying uh, in front of uh, Grandmother Moon. And it was uh, a painting that uh, that Jay painted, and uh, I, unfortunately, uh, uh, my son passed uh, away about a year ago, uh, come June. And uh, and so these three great artists, uh, Norvell Morso, who was uh, uh, who Jay actually studied with, as well as uh, another relative of his. Uh, uh, Daphne Ojig, uh, he's, he's studied with her. And uh, Leland Bell, uh, who is his uncle, who's also a, an incredible artist from, from Manitoulin Island. So all these artists have been uh, uh, making a great contribution to the um, uh, culture and, and uh, the knowledge of Indigenous people. So I just thought uh, I'd uh, share that with everybody. And I also uh, could share the poems with you that I wrote about these three incredible artists. Uh, um, I, I have a um, uh, new new book of poetry that I've uh, uh, just uh, brought out. It's just called Poetry. And uh, in in this uh, book, I'll, I'll start with the poem that uh, that I wrote for uh, uh, Norvell, uh, more so, who started off what was now known as the uh, Woodland School of Art. Norvell, when I first met him back in the 60s, he had just arrived in Toronto and he brought uh, incredible paintings that uh, have since become world famous. And almost anywhere you go in uh, any uh, government office or any art gallery, uh, uh, his work is, is, uh, is everywhere. And he was, he's called the grandfather uh, of the native art movement in Canada. And the poem goes like this. It was written uh, just uh, back in, in in uh, about uh, 30 years ago or so. Norvell, Norvell, what's driving you? Are the spirits talking? Are the spirits coming through? Are they talking to you? You've lived in the forest all of your life. You've been hungry and you've suffered strife and you paint with the blood of a thousand years. You paint the legends and you paint the fears and you paint the birch bark and you paint the sand and you paint your sweat with an ancient hand. They took your paintings and hung them in town. They took your body and flung it around so the world could see an Indian in high society. They gave you a china cup filled with tea, but you drowned their pale faces in brown whiskey. You painted their Jesus to expose their hypocrisy. You lived in their churches, you know in their jails, and you laughed when they said you had failed. Your art will be living when they're all dead. 
You took their green money and you painted it red. You paint your canvas with a brush of pain. And you signed your works with an Indian name. You're an Ojibwe man, a child of this land, an artist, a prophet with a torch in your hand, a blueprint for seeing, and it's not for sale, a harbor for living in the eyes of a gale. The people, they love you and they know your truth. The culture is yours. You can never lose. The indigenous nations are listening to your voice. They're learning your wisdom and your pride. They're painting with a brush you passed on to them with a talent they no longer need to hide. Yes, you've opened the doors and the windows too. The spirits are talking. Yes, the spirits are coming through. So that was a poem that I wrote for uh, Norvell. And uh, uh, he uh, certainly inspired uh, an incredible amount of art along the way. And uh, he was, like I say, called the uh, grandfather of native art. And then uh, I have Daphne Ojig here. Her, her art, um, let me just... Uh, Fix this uh, here. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, it's it's re remarkable uh, paintings that uh, that Daphne did, and uh, my friend Bonnie Devine wrote uh, this this book uh, and uh, featured her beautiful paintings in in here. Uh, like this one here. Robert Houle is also uh, featured featured in the in the book, and uh, I wrote a poem for Daphne, uh, and it goes goes like this. There's a place they call the haunted shore. It's where the ancient spirits dwell. And you can hear their voices singing like the ringing of a bell. And the echo washes over you in kayak or canoe. The swirling of the white caps, the howling of the wind. They take you on a journey to the past, then bring you back again. And there upon those ancient rocks, with simple brush and pen, our ancestors painted with red, red ochre as a medium. The people drew their legacy in colors and in line. The memory of 10,000 years eternally enshrined. Since then, those days have faded fast. Canoes and kayaks no longer journey to the haunted rocks to view the ancient past. Today, that world has been replaced by computers and cell phones, and we no longer see the smoking fires of those ancient ones, the uncontaminated sanctuary that was their flesh and bones. Each generation that is born must walk a different path, guided by a map drawn by those whose destiny it is to document the past. On Manitoulin Island, where the great mystery dwells, Daphne Ojig was born in that sacred land with a vision in her mind and a paintbrush in her hand. And as she wandered in meadows where the hawberry grows, she heard the stories that the wild creatures told. Paint me, the voices cried. Paint me as I once was. Paint me, your mother earth and the people that she loves. Paint the embers that are burning, the wigwam that is well lit. Paint the milestones of our journey that is not over yet. Paint the challenges that face us, the struggles to be met. Paint the faith, the hope, and the visions of the past that we must not forget. Thank you, Daphne Ojig and Megwetch. Your canvases are a diagram etched in time, each painting stitched together 
like a patchwork quilt, warms the dreaming spirit and gives guidance to the soul. Our children in the future may well walk among the stars in biospheres on Venus and on Mars. And they may never swim in the sparkling waters of a river, lake, or pond. Your paintings will be the memory of a universe that is gone, an echo from the past to which the future must respond. As our Mother Earth continues to evolve and the human family to exist, it is the artist who unveils our collective consciousness. We thank the Creator for giving us the privilege to witness such a gift. Thank you, Daphne Ojig. Thank you. Thank you, and Meg Wedge. And this last poem I'd like to share with you is uh, called My Son, J. Bell Redford, who painted the uh, painting that's behind me and many others that I have hanging in uh, my apartment here in downtown Toronto. And this poem is uh, for Jay. Medicine win, the elders named him. Muskogee, Newton of the Anishinaabe nation. All our relations are his kin. The creature teachers called him friend. His father from the turtle clan, his mother from the loon. One shared the wisdom of the sun, the other the beauty of the moon. He was born with a sacred mission, a blessing from the divine, to paint the ancient wisdom with color, form, and line. Each separate sacred moment brought images to his mind. Then on the current of inspiration, like a canoe upon a river, his hand released the stories like arrows in a quiver. The quarry was the canvas and paintings to deliver. One by one, the brush strokes were filled with light and color in a peaceful, loving beauty path that humanity could discover. There is healing truth and humility embedded in each painting. They sing and chant their way within the human heart while Jay gave meaning to their teachings with his art. Muskiki, Newton of the Anishinaabe Nation, all the Earth's creations are his kin. They called him the embodiment of the medicine wind. I wrote that for my son, and I'm hoping that a good medicine wind comes flowing through all our lives now and blows this horrible virus away and brings healing to to uh, all of us and our and nations uh, around the world because it's a very important time and it's wonderful that we have artists with us still that can uh, that can paint these stories of this time that is going to be a historical moment in the lives of all of us. Thank you, Duke. You're welcome, Roger. It's wonderful. I'm just going to take you out and put you straight back in the stream. Your audio seems a little off, so just give me one oh, second here. Oops. Try again. Can you say something? Okay, sure, sure. That's better. Okay. Sometimes there's little glitches. <laughs> like earlier, it, between your second and third poem, I popped in and then I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those with us. And like you said, uh, you know, artists and what they can do, whether through visual arts or poetry, like there's so much that's uh, being shared. And in this pandemic, it's an important time to be hearing from the artists. Yes. Uh, and from, uh, 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 art is, uh, is with us the, the day we're born. It starts with, uh, with a heartbeat, which is the, uh, brings music, uh, to our life through the drum, which is our heartbeat, and uh, our, our, our eyes and what we see in our imagination. The world that's uh, ahead of us requires a lot of creativity, innovation, invention, and imagination uh, to carry us uh, through to, uh, for the next uh, uh, 100 years and, and on. 
Well, there's many people uh, liking, and there's a few comments here. Shannon said the same thing I did, which is I also enjoy just listening. So there might not be many questions because people are just willing to hear anything you'd like to share. But Shannon does ask, wonderful. Thank you for the beautiful reading. What is your book called again? You know, it's uh, it, it's simply called just poetry. <laughs> it's just Duke Redbird. Poetry. Red Duke poetry. Redbird Poetry. It just, it, you know, it was uh, something, it, it, it just ar arrived uh, from the, uh, uh, from the printers uh, on the uh, 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 first week of, of March. And uh, they went into uh, storage, uh, like uh, uh, at the school where I work at the center, the uh, Urban Indigenous Education Center, we, we put them there. And then uh, pandemic came. The building was uh, closed down, so I don't have any that I can uh, ship out and, and uh, send out to anyone just yet. But uh, when the book is available for uh, uh, that, I could actually uh, send them out to people that want one. Uh, I'll I'll let them know through through the uh, Facebook or uh, on uh, uh, the the other uh, platforms that we have to share these, this kind of information. Okay, so following you on social media and making sure we're connected. Yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth says she loves the pure title. She loves that you've just called it poetry. Perfect. Yeah. Well, that's that's what it is. And, uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I think of, of uh, uh, these, these difficult times uh, are, uh, uh, they they give us pause to stop and and when you when you're when you're uh, uh, encounter something that you you've never encountered before uh, and you can become very very depressed and very blue and and very sad and I know that uh, times like this there's uh, uh, we can get down on ourselves and everything, but I want to leave a message and or share a message with uh, with everyone that uh, uh, human beings they say have been on the earth for two and a half million years, and in that time, uh, every one of our ancestors uh, had to uh, uh, navigate their lives in such a way otherwise none of us would be here today to watch this uh this this uh, program so i wrote a poem to try to explain uh what, it, what i'm talking about and just in the event that there are there are uh young people or folks out there that uh that are, that are finding this time very difficult and and uh i hope that that uh this, this poem that I have here will uh, inspire you uh, to, uh, uh, before you make any uh, rash decisions about anything, uh, take a moment to think about the words of this poem. And it goes like this. It's called, You Belong. All you folks out there who are in the winter of despair, when nothing in this world seems right and darkness shades the light, when everything that once brought happiness and good has turned from pure gold to rotten wood, when pain and suffering seems more than you can bear, when bullies chase and taunt and scare, when there is no one anywhere who wants to listen or even care, and all your thoughts are to run and hide, or worse yet, commit suicide. When you only have one voice inside that cries out, Creator, be my guide. This is too hard. I can't decide. Remember that somewhere in the distant past, an ancestor of yours had a similar task and the same questions to ask. Maybe a grandmother in a residential school or a grandfather 
out in the cold without any fuel, or further back yet, when the smallpox came and there was no cure, your ancestors bore the suffering and the pain because that they knew if they gave up and they were not able to overcome, there would be no granddaughter or grandson. They had to navigate the storm to ensure that you, their child, would be born. And now it's your turn to carry on, to help the spirits waiting for so long to come to earth and to give them birth. Your ancestors did not falter for a hundred thousand years. They lived that you might also know the secrets of the stars above, the wisdom of the earth below. So now, I urge you to keep the circle strong. Tomorrow will bring a brighter dawn. The Creator wants you to stay right here where you belong. I love that. <laughs> Thank well, you. It's all part of what we, what we, uh, I have to I have to think about it every day. Uh, is uh, there's uh, a reason for everything, and and there's a good reason that we uh, were born in the first place, and there's a good reason to get up every morning and say, uh, "This is uh, the world." Uh, like the old saying goes, "Universe is unfolding exactly the way the Creator expected and wanted it to." So. Mm. Do you feel that there's any particular lessons for us in this time? Like if things are unfolding as they should, what what should we be learning or what should we be holding on to? The most, the most important the most important lesson to learn uh is that uh uh the real wealth is health. Uh money can't buy you uh uh, uh, health or love or any of the the things that that uh, we uh, uh, so so dearly love in our lives, uh, it, uh, it's that's not the way it happens. Uh, the uh, real wealth in this life is uh, to be uh, 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 able to uh, get. Through for the day you're born till till the day that uh, you're uh, burst into eternity, uh, to, to be, uh, learn to have wisdom to acquire uh, you know uh, compassion and goodness and kindness and and, and love and uh, and all all of these things are are how we uh, uh, should conduct our ourselves uh, for a good journey and we have the teachings that we have that come from the forest uh which are the uh what we call the seven ancestor uh, teachings uh, some call them the grandmother teachings some the grandfather teachings depending on 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 who uh passed them on but you know uh uh the uh real information platform of all knowledge is nature and um we have been uh humans haven't been that kind to uh mother earth uh, uh for the last four or five hundred years and uh and as a result uh, uh mother nature needed a rest uh, and i see this as a time when when uh, the uh, air is cleaner uh the uh Certainly, the the uh, animal kingdom and the and the plant kingdom and uh, all these uh, natural worlds seem to be uh, uh, benefiting from this this respite they have from from the uh, uh, constant interference by human beings. And one of the lessons that uh, I, I guess I hope that we take back from this is that. Uh, uh, our job as human beings isn't to change nature to suit ourselves. 
it's to change ourselves to suit nature if we want to have sustainability and uh, and and live a uh, a good prosperous happy uh, uh, life as much as we can. I mean, every life has has challenges. Every life has has a share of pain and suffering. There's no doubt about that. But we don't have to add to it by by uh, deliberately um, causing climate change and interfering with the natural world that has supported us for. Uh, since uh, the time began, and when we look at, uh, at what does the uh, food forest that used to be here before it was all cut down uh, taught us about the seven canopies of, of, of the food forest, the old trees, the old maple and oak and, uh, and walnut, uh, beech nut trees that were the first canopy and protected all the other, other uh, plants and trees. Uh, these these trees were called the wisdom trees, and uh, uh, and walnuts, in fact, uh, uh, look like little brains. If you when you crack the shell open, there's it looks just like a, like a human brain inside. And we knew that walnuts were good for your mind and good for your brain. Uh, it was brain food. We knew that simply by looking at the walnuts and the and the maple sap that uh, ran in the maple trees. Also, we've learned uh, science tells us now that that maple syrup is very good for uh, for, for it's good brain food, uh, along with uh, you know other foods like fish and so on. But uh, we learned wisdom. Our wisdom was in those trees because they lived lived many many uh, moons, so many years, many winters, and they protected the next canopy of trees, which were more fragile. Uh, uh, they uh, 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 had uh, not the same uh, kind of strength uh, as as the big old oak trees, but uh, they uh, uh, were able to withstand harsh winters and hurricanes and bad times and everything. And guess what? They always gave us the fruit because they had the. We learned courage from those fruit trees that. Uh, uh, no matter what uh, kind of uh, challenges those fruit trees suffered from, in the fall, when it was time for the harvest, there were always apples, pears, plums, cherries. They were all there. So we learned courage from those trees. And then, then there was another canopy of food that was right up, that lived underneath those those fruit trees, and that was all the berry bushes, the raspberry, the blueberries, the thimbleberries, the uh, their berries, they were, and they all were different textures, different colors, different sizes, but they lived together and they grew together. They, they were uh, self-propagating and they were uh, 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 living next, one plant next to the other. And, and guess what we learned from that was respect. If the plants could have respect for each other, they didn't care what color they were, what they tasted like, how large or how small, there was respect. We learned that to be the way to, to journey forward. And then underneath the, 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 the berry bushes, there, there was all the plants that were, were uh, so transparently good for you that blue that grew above the ground like tomatoes and and cucumbers and 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 plants that the animals uh shared and ate and we recognized that they were just honest plants and we didn't have to worry about uh uh consuming them and eating them and it was and we learned about honesty from those plants and then right on the on the ground itself were all the medicine plants and you had to uh uh, really search and, and almost be like a scientist to sort the good ones from the from the from the bad ones, like the good ivies from the poison ivies, uh, the good mushrooms from the toadstools, and and in that we learned about truth, that truth requires uh, searching out. It it um, it's something that uh, the that we learned from the medicines, and then underneath. You had to dig down to get the tubers and the food that was underneath the ground, like you know, uh, 
turnips and potatoes and things like that. And, they, and it, it required humility to get down on your hands and knees and dig into the earth. And we learned humility that way. And then we saw all the uh, pines and the uh, ferns that went through the forest and embraced the trees and so on. And we uh, saw that, that in that embrace was love. And we learned about love. And those seven ancestor teachings, we got directly by walking through the forest and being healed in the in the power of, of, of nature and learning. That was our school. That was our university. That's where we got our knowledge. That's where the wisdom came from. And it was all there for the taking. And we can still do it today. I mean, uh, when it's time for people to get out walk in nature, enjoy nature. Of course, keep the distance because that's important right now. But uh, boy, uh, nature, uh, you can learn a lot right in your own backyard. Yeah, absolutely. I, I personally feel a lot more connected to nature since this all began. I think it's forced us to slow down. And right now I have like a well little vegetable garden on my windowsill just waiting to be planted once it's a little bit warmer this weekend. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot to learn if we're willing to listen. And I, I think that, you know, uh, uh, technology is, uh, is, is, um, is something that uh, uh, nature gave us a brain we got our 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 uh, our human uh, um, uh, body and, and and brain and thoughts and consciousness from nature, mm -hmm. and nature doesn't mind invention, doesn't mind imagination because in its own uh, processes in nature is the evolutionary processes that create. Uh, uh, Things that are that um, uh, uh, you know they talk about uh, how nature changes over generations. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with using technology and using our imagination, but we have to use it for its proper use, which is for the enlightenment and enhancement of the human condition, not to. Uh, uh, just uh, use these uh, uh, technologies simply for toys and amusement and um, and uh, filling up our our bank accounts because there's there's uh, it's a shame to use our imaginations just for that mm. yeah <laughs> it's very uh, it's a challenging time for that isn't it because I I mean, where I, my whole life is on my, on my phone and on my computer right now, you know, social life, work life. Um, and I find myself feeling drained just uh, with too much of it and getting back out into nature surely, surely helps. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, they're talking about now is that we have to, uh, acquire an equilibrium between uh, the uh, engagement with nature and the engagement with our our technologies. And if we can maintain an equilibrium, we'll we'll be okay. But if if you think of equilibrium as a teeter totter, we can't have it all down on one side because uh, we're not we're not going to get any joy out of life uh, sitting. Uh, uh, with uh, one one end of the uh, of our reality, uh, not engaging the equilibrium of the universe that we live in. Mm, well, hopefully the equilibrium will be restored somewhat if we're smarter about what we're doing here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think we will be. Uh, I, I I mean, uh, there's uh, we don't have an option. We have to get smarter. Yeah. There's some lovely comments here. Uh, we even have a friend tuning in from Dubai right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, saying hello. <laughs> uh, Tracy Dawn says, beautiful miigwech, Duke. Oh, That's wow. another miigwech. And uh, Marianne uh, from YouTube was saying, creator has given you the ability to speak with both compassion and conviction. You speak to our spirits. 
Oh, lovely. Thank you. Yes. And there's a nice question from here, here saying, in all of your accomplishments in moving the Indigenous conversations into the spotlight they deserve, has there been a pivotal moment when you realized that your efforts would have a lasting impact? Well, uh, the um, uh, uh, birth of my my latest uh, grand uh, great granddaughter uh, recently, my uh, my grandson and his uh, you know, his wife, um, uh, they have two children. Uh, Haven and and the uh, second second child, brand new uh, great grandchild, Jill is her name. So I, it's like heaven and earth, uh, haven and earth. And uh, and when I see my uh, great grandchildren, I have uh, another wonderful uh, young young man from my other daughter, a young boy, uh, uh, Hayden. Uh, that's the pivotal moment in my lifetime to see my uh, my great grandchildren uh, they're uh, they're going to carry on and they're going to carry that torch and they're going to carry it uh, uh, because of the of, of the uh, teachings and the wisdom that their their parents have acquired uh, both from uh, my, my my children and now uh, they passed it on to their children, and now there's great grandchildren. So, so the the line goes on, and uh, and uh, uh, that's that's how it all happens. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's what we pass on to uh, the future generations, and uh, and if they can uh, uh, take advantage of the wisdom and experience of their elders. And it's uh, very important that we take care of our elders because, as you know, uh, there's been uh, this pandemic has affected so many elders in uh, isolated in 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 uh, nursing homes and so on. And and um, uh, I think that you know in in indigenous community we. Uh, we took care of our elders in, in at home uh, with the family. It was uh, uh, they weren't um, isolated, uh, and uh, that was the tradition anyway. But uh, now we have to think of, I think, do some rethinking about how we take care of, of our of our elders uh, because they do uh, have so much wisdom to share, and um, how many. Uh, children would like to have a conversation with their grandparents right today and, and their grandparents are there or great grandparents so uh, that's uh, another lesson I think that this pandemic has brought home that uh, uh, there's uh, we don't want to miss uh, what's all those important uh, uh, applications that we have in our life it's not all Electronic devices, but it's it's true the the uh, wisdom that's sitting right in 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 our in our own families. Yeah, and passing on that wisdom, like what a beautiful thing, even for us to learn from you today, and to hear wisdom about the seven ancestral teachings and how that relates to us now. You even yesterday when we were having a brief chat uh, before we connected. You even talked about how different every day is and just learning that, like you said, something like the river we step in tomorrow is not the one we're in today. And that really sat with me because although it seems like every day is the same, it's it's really not and things can change in an instant. Well, this, 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 this is uh, uh, another lesson that, that uh, um, has come uh, at uh, home to to uh, to roost in our in our realities is that uh, wow uh, every day is precious and uh, and uh, days are worthy to take care of in a in, a, in his best fashion that we can uh, uh, together for ourselves yeah that's true beautiful. Um, 
You know, I, I was thinking even when you were talking about the creativity, the painters, the artists, like this, the DWF live sessions that we're doing now um, was part of our artist ambassador program where we were bringing indigenous and non-indigenous artists into schools. But because of the pandemic, of course, we're not in the schools, similar to you as well at the TDSB, you're doing work outside of the school, but for it. Um, thankfully, we were able to move these to online, uh, partly because RBC Future Launch supported us to do so and bring all these indigenous voices of these amazing artists to people that are tuning in, not just across Canada, but also in other areas. Do you have any words of wisdom for the artists out there or for the people who feel this creativity inside themselves that they want to share? Well, one, one thing is uh, that every human being on earth is an indigenous person from somewhere. Because the word indigenous itself simply means a spontaneous relationship with a place. And, and that... Uh, uh, means that um, uh, this brings us around to the fact that that uh, there are no human races. That 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 is a uh, construction that was put together by by uh, in a science that has now been totally discredited. We find out that there's only one race. It's called the human race, and we're all members of it, and we all bring. Uh, 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 a vision from our particular culture. And if we understand that culture, the definition of culture is anything you invent, borrow, or discover that satisfies your needs is your culture. And we share so much uh, culture from every part of the world right here in Toronto. And, and as we borrow, as we discover, as we as we uh, invent, uh, we are we are participating in a in a in a, uh, a new Canadian culture, and uh, part of the tapestry of that culture, the threads that we feed the loom, will create a beautiful culture that is uh, is, is contributed by every single artist or person that's on uh, the earth today. And if we want to have a human tapestry that, that, uh, that, that, the, that the creator will, will, will be in awe of, uh, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. On that, would you share another one of your poems with us? Sure. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I I I have I have one here that uh, uh, sort of speaks to who we are as Canadians, and it's 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 simply called "I am I'm a Canadian." Duke, as you go here, can you come forward just a little bit? Sometimes what's happening is the, I think it's the ambient sound behind you. It's making your audio cut out. Oh, I'm rocking a bit. All right. That's so, bad. so this is, this is uh, my poem. I, I, it goes like this. I'm a lobster fisherman in Newfoundland. I'm a clam bake in PEI. I'm a picnic. I'm a banquet. I'm mother's homemade pie. I'm a few laughs in a legion hall in Fredericton. I'm a kite flyer out in a field in Moncton. I'm a nap on the porch after a hard day's work is done. I'm a snowball fight in true Nova Scotia. I'm small kids playing jacks and skipping rope. I'm a mother who lost a son in the last great war. And I'm a bride with a brand new ring and a chest of hope. I'm an Easterner. I'm a Westerner. I'm from the north and I'm from the south. I've swam in two big oceans and I've loved them both. Oh, I'm a clown in Quebec during Carnival. I'm a mass in the Cathedral of St. Paul. I'm a hockey game in the Forum. I'm Rocker Richard and Jean Bellyvo. I'm a coach for Little League Rascals. I'm a 
babysitter for sleep defying ra uh, rascals. I'm a canoe trip down the Ottawa. I'm a holiday on the Trent. I'm a mortgage. I'm alone. I'm last week's unpaid rent. I'm Toronto after dark. I'm a walk in the park. I'm Winnipeg gold eye. I'm a handmade trout fly. I'm a wheat field and a sunset under a prairie sky. I'm Viola Desmond. I'm Alexander Graham Bell. I'm a powwow dancer and I'm Louis Riel. I'm the Calgary Stampede. I'm a feathered star sea. I'm Edmonton at night. I'm a Northern Lights. I'm a rigger. I'm a cat. I'm a 10 gallon hat and an unnamed mountain in the interior of BC. I'm a maple tree and a totem pole. I'm sunshine showers and fresh cut flowers. I'm a ferry boat ride to the island. I'm the Yukon. I'm the Northwest Territories. I'm the Arctic Ocean and the Beaufort Sea. I'm the prairies. I'm the Great Lakes. I'm the Rockies. I'm the Laurentians. I am French. I am English. I'm Inuit, First Nation, and Métis. But more than this, above all this, I am a Canadian and proud to be free. Well, we're all Canadians. We're all proud to be free. And we're going to get through this pandemic. Mark my words. That's so great. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I just want you to read poetry all afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You've been such a wonderful friend to our organization, to the Gordani and Shani Wenjack Fund, an elder and a supporter of the work that we do. And, um, you know, a poem like that and the unifying power that it has really means a lot in that journey towards reconciliation and understanding how to better connect. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, part of what uh, our journey is, uh, has gotten us this far. It's, uh, we're, we're, like I say, we're going to get, get through this. And, uh, and I'm happy uh, to say uh, uh, the work that you do at the foundation and uh, uh, everything that uh, we're uh, 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 the voice uh, of uh, Gord Downey and all the others who have gone before us, who, who worked uh, for so long in so many different ways to bring uh, reconciliation to uh, to our nation, uh, and uh, the work goes on. So I'm, I'm so happy to be a participant, I tell you. Uh, it's wonderful. Thank you for being there for me, too. Oh, we're grateful. We really are. What will be your plan or focus once this pandemic is over? Um, is there anything you're returning to or new projects you'll be beginning, or what will be your plans then? The uh, uh, big ones right now are uh, uh, I have a, a new song that's out uh, with, uh, with the Sultans of, of, of uh, Strength. Yeah with uh, Chris McCool. Uh, he uh, put together a, a, a beautiful um, uh, composition for a, a poem I wrote. Uh, and um, so uh, uh, that's uh, on the horizon of actually uh, going on tour. And uh, also I'm, I'm, I'm working on some more poetry and and when this is all over, I hope to do some readings and some uh, uh, book launches and get the get the poems out. I'm also uh, working on um, a, a documentary uh, associated with uh, my own story that uh, uh, is uh, uh, in the making right now. So there's so much. Uh, uh, to do there and of course i still work full time with the toronto district school board as their senior consultant in uh, uh in the uh, native arts and culture uh, so there's uh, uh i plenty to do and i'm looking forward to uh it'll open you up a bit i understand now this this uh, uh long weekend it's going to have an opportunity for people to get out into uh, nature and uh, 
So uh, as long as everyone uh, keeps their distance and washes their hands, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll get through this, and we'll should have a reasonable summer. I I should think. I hope so. Well, Duke, it has been so wonderful to have you here as a guest and thank you to everyone who's been tuning in. I've seen there's, I've been checking my phone because there's multiple watch parties on, on Facebook. I don't know if you know, but people can actually host a watch party on their page. Um, so I've been trying, oh, there's something happening out there. Um, I've been trying to keep an eye on the watch parties because just so everyone knows, if you are in a watch party and commenting there, the comments don't come through to the feed here. So I'm trying to make sure we don't miss any questions. But, um, you know, it's there's been many different people tuning in and hearing your stories. And it's been really, really wonderful to have you this afternoon. Well, I certainly, I should, certainly am. Wonderful. Um, stay on, Duke, after we end the broadcast. Please stay on for a moment because I have a few other questions to ask you behind the curtain. <laughs> um, are there any final words or anything you'd like to share with us before we go into the long weekend? Uh, I just uh, I, I want uh, uh, people, to, you know, of course, to stay safe and everything. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with, uh, with, with an with an old uh, native prayer that uh, will will take us uh, into 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 the future, and it goes like this: Oh, my mother, the earth; oh, my father, the sky. Your children are we, and with tired backs we bring to you the gifts that you love: sage, sweet grass, tobacco, and cedar. Then we for us and garment of brightness. May the weft be the white light of morning. May the warp be the red light of evening. May the fringe be the falling rain, and may the border be the standing rainbow. Then weave for us a garment of brightness, that we may fittingly walk where birds sing, that we may fittingly walk where grass is green. O my mother, the earth, O my father, the sky. Megwetch. Megwetch. Thank you very much, Duke. Sit tight and we'll catch up in a moment. Everyone, this has been Dr. Duke Redbird who has been sharing with us today. Make sure that you tune in uh, to his page as he often shares some wisdom there and he has his book of poetry called Poetry coming out once uh, this pandemic's over and he can get to the crate of boxes. Um, and we are so looking forward to connecting again with you, Duke, in the very near future, we hope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for everybody, um, it's, we're going into the long weekend. On Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to be re airing the broadcast of the interview that I did with Kevin Hearn of the Bare Naked Ladies. Kevin was part of the original Secret Path band and then also played again in 2019 when we restaged Secret Path with a variety of Indigenous and non Indigenous musicians at Roy Thompson Hall. Uh, Kevin is just a beautiful person with a lot of stories to share about Gord, about making Secret Path, but also he uh, has a, an interesting connection to the interview we just did here with Duke Redbird, where Duke talked about artist Norval Morisot. Um, there's actually a documentary that Kevin Hearn uh, helped to produce based on him buying a counterfeit painting that was supposedly by Norval Morisot, but he found out it wasn't and all sorts of um, all sorts of interesting things ensued. I encourage you to check out that documentary, There Are No Fakes, and check out the interview on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time to hear me speak with Kevin Hearn. This has been DWF Live. We have so enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Duke Redbird, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Remember that you can share this, um, with your friends, comment, like, it helps us to spread the word and to get people more connected to an impor important Indigenous teachings and Indigenous artists in this time. Hope that you have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you very soon.